After the eclipse, what happens? I'd like to tell you about some of the things you'll see. The first is that God's word will continue to be fulfilled. And what do I mean by that? Well, Jesus gave us many indicators for discerning the signs of the times, not just one. Yes, people are concerned in bringing massive attention to Luke 21, verse 25, which says, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. The April eclipse can understandably be interpreted as signs in the sun, moon, and stars. However, we also have to be mindful that Jesus gave us a full prophetic picture in Matthew chapter 24. And so, strange signs in the sky is only one aspect. But Matthew 24 reveals that there will be a massive deception in the last days. And I imagine this level of deception to be unprecedented. It will be open deception, the kind that is so egregious, but still, some people will believe it. Furthermore, we will see an increase in false prophets, false messiahs, wars and rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, pestilences, or rather pandemics. The persecution of Christians will increase. The love of most will grow cold. The gospel will be preached to the whole world. So you see, when looking at the signs of the last days, we should never magnify one single sign. And this leads me to my next point. The closer we get, the crazier things will get. Indeed, the longer we are living in these last days, does it not appear to you that things seem to be increasingly volatile? Deception is on the increase. Movies, music, even certain churches and their doctrine. If you look closely and research online, you'll find the Christian persecution is on the rise. And alternatively, with the growth and popularity of the internet and streaming services, the gospel is reaching more and more people around the world. The closer we get to the end of the age, the more crazy the world will become, because we'll see a lot of end time signs ramping up. The final thing I would like to mention is that over the next few weeks, months, and even years, you will see more and more things that will concern you, perhaps worry you even. But always remember this. The Bible says in Luke 21, verse 28, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So the key message to all of us as believers is that when we see the signs that the Bible tells us to watch out for, when we see these signs come to light, we should not be swayed to the left or to the right, but instead we should stand and lift up our heads because our redemption the return of Jesus Christ is drawing nearer. David Wilkerson preached a message titled, Last Days, Satanic Seduction. He said words to the following effect. I heard a radio host not too long ago mocking the coming of Jesus Christ. And he said, you Christians have been calling these the last days for 2,000 years. Nothing has changed. Every generation has had its troubles and disasters. How about you tell me about it 200 years from now? Now, the Bible predicts that that kind of scoffing will happen in the last days. In fact, Peter warned us, saying, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? David Wilkerson then went on to teach and say, It's not that evil has gotten stronger, or that it's more seductive than any other age, because we have Christians today. In spite of all the increased wickedness, they are growing closer to Jesus. They are more holy than any past generation. We have a remnant people that are walking in the midst of all this filth, untouched. Overcomers in Jesus Christ. But Paul sees in this last generation a giving heed to seducing spirits. He's saying that hell is going to open up its mouth and out will come hordes of seducing spirits. Spirits that will seduce 
if it were possible, even the elect or chosen of God. And let me just say one thing. Seducing spirits sound good. They sound right, but that's as far as it goes. But the true gospel of Christ challenges. It convicts. It enlightens. It demands a response in terms of changing the way you live or think and aligning it to God's word. Now, he gave this great illustration along the lines of, Suppose Paul, the apostle, came back to life, and you just allow him to see the quote-unquote miracles of today. For him to see a car or an airplane, it would be mind-boggling. But if he went into our homes and see that little box, they turn it on, and all of a sudden there, you don't have to go to a house of harlotry. But right there in the home is access to sinful adult entertainment. A wicked wonder. Great signs and wonders of seduction. The word seduced means to be enticed and led away from what is right and moral and clean. Satan has some of you that are sitting here tonight. He has already taken you by the hand and he's leading you into a seduction. He's seducing you away from the heart of God, from the heart of Jesus Christ. And you're under deception and the Holy Ghost wants to expose that tonight. He wants to reveal it so he can save you from it. Just think about what he said here. Satanic seduction will never be something overtly evil. You'll never see a red, scary demon attempting to seduce someone. It will always be subtle things, things that appear harmless. But as a matter of fact, you end up spending more time doing those things than anything related to God. Let's look at a few practical examples. Entertainment. You have your phone, social media. You spend so much time scrolling, and then you want to unwind and watch a movie or a new television series. Then you have the option of your new virtual reality headset. Or, for some, they're into gaming. And before you know it, it's the end of the day, and you've spent no time in prayer or in the Word. Maybe you're into fitness. Work out, you have your meal prep, you have to go to bed early to make sure that you get your eight hours of sleep before you're off to work in the morning. Day in and day out, you perhaps only pray half-heartedly or read a verse or two before bed. These aren't bad things necessarily, but when they stop you from spending time with God, then you are deceived as to what is really important. Distractions in life can be devastating. Think about the damage that a distracted driver can cause. Think about the potential danger of being distracted while walking down a large flight of stairs. A surgeon has to tune out all distractions so that they can perform surgery. But for the believer in Christ, we should fight to maintain our focus on Christ. There has never been a time in history like we are facing today, where we are consistently bombarded with distractions. We are being distracted at every point, from technology to world events, not to mention the people in our lives. At any given time, there is always something or someone to distract us. But hear me, saints of God, if we allow them, if we give them access, distractions will cause us to lose focus on what matters most. What matters most is your walk with the Most High God. What matters most is your relationship with Jesus Christ. What matters most is whether you are obedient to God's word or not. What matters most is that you love your neighbor as you love yourself and live a life that is holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. A pastor by the name of Adrian Rogers once said this regarding people who neglect their relationship with God. The backslider is a saved person who's out of fellowship with God. If there was ever a time when you loved the Lord Jesus Christ more than you love Him at this moment, if there was ever a time He meant more to you, when prayer was sweeter to you, when worship was more real to you, when your service was more effective for the Lord Jesus Christ, if there ever was a time like that when it was more than it is now, you may be backsliding." End quote. 
If you're no longer praying, what's distracting you? If you're no longer spending time studying God's Word, what's distracting you? In December 1972, the United States suffered one of the worst disasters in its aviation history when the Eastern Airlines Flight 401 crashed. The tragedy in this story can be found in not only what happened, but how it happened. One article reads as follows. According to a National Transportation Safety Board report, the pilots placed the landing gear handle down, but noticed the green light that indicates that the nose landing gear is fully extended and locked failed to illuminate. The pilot told the control tower of their problem and explained that they would have to circle the runway until they could find a green light. The control tower accepted and told them to maintain an altitude of 2,000 feet. The pilots put the plane on autopilot as they investigated the problem. Now, reports go on to suggest that for seven to eight minutes, the flight crew worked together to try and figure out what was wrong with this light. An article by NBC Miami reported on the incident saying, the pilots engaged the autopilot so they could inspect the light and the landing gear, but the darkness apparently made it hard to see. A short time later, the plane was cleared to turn back to Miami, and that's when a crew member noticed something was amiss. We did something to the altitude, the first officer remarked, and the captain's reply was, what? We're still at 2,000, right? The first officer asked, and the captain immediately exclaimed, hey, what's happening here? Seconds later, the plane crashed into the ground at 227 miles per hour and at a distance of 19 miles away from the airport. Investigators concluded that the probable cause for the crash was that the autopilot was accidentally disengaged and the entire flight crew failed to keep an eye on the flight instruments. They were too distracted trying to fix the landing gear light that no one checked on the actual plane itself. You see, the thing about distractions is that the enemy designs them in such a way that they take your time, they take your energy, they take and take from you, and eventually, distractions will derail you from your purpose. The enemy wants to distract you because he doesn't want you committed to Christ. He doesn't want you to serve him faithfully, so he sends distractions that are meant to take your focus away from Jesus. Distractions are also there to starve your prayer life and to starve you of your time of worship. The devil is the author of confusion, and he knows exactly how to disturb, divert, and distract your attention so that in the end, your focus isn't on the Lord. The enemy desperately wants you to invest your time in meaningless things. He knows how to get you to spend time doing numerous things that are worthless, so you lose time. Distractions come in many forms. Distractions can come in the form of people and enemies who want to destroy you. Distractions can come in the form of entertainment. If you're not careful, you'll spend hours and hours watching TV shows and movies day after day. The enemy loves when we spend our energy on things that offer zero value to us spiritually. The enemy loves it when we focus on things that will never edify or build you up in your faith. We, as people of God, must guard our hearts and our time. I want to give you four illustrations of how deception is working in this world and why it's accepted by so many. The first illustration is what I'd like to call the chameleon's disguise. Imagine a chameleon expertly blending into its surroundings, adapting its appearance to conceal its true identity. This is similar to a person who looks like a Christian. They talk like a Christian and can even go as far as acting like a Christian when you see them. However, their heart, their intentions are far from Jesus Christ. This is how deception in the last days often presents itself in ways that mimic truth. Deception today makes things challenging for a person to distinguish between truth and lie. Jesus warned us in Matthew 24 verse 24 saying, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Just as the chameleon's disguise requires careful observation, it requires you to pay close attention. We too must be vigilant and discerning, seeking the unchanging truth found in God's word. 
The second illustration is the mirage of shiny illusions. Think of a traveler crossing a desert, parched and weary. In the distance, a shimmering oasis appears, promising relief. However, as the traveler draws closer, the mirage dissolves, leaving disappointment. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 to 4, the Apostle Paul warns, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. The allure of false teachings can be as deceptive as a mirage, leaving us spiritually thirsty. True refreshment comes from the living water of Christ's teachings. The third illustration is the puzzle of half-truths. Picture a puzzle missing a few pieces. From a distance, it seems complete, but closer inspection reveals the gaps. It reveals that things are fragmented and incomplete. Deception often involves partial truths, carefully interwoven to create a convincing narrative. Jesus emphasized the importance of discernment in Luke 21, verse 8, when he said, Watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. Just as a puzzle requires all its pieces to form a coherent picture, we must rely on the complete counsel of God's word to guard against deception. Now, my final illustration is not so much geared at understanding deception, but rather unmasking deception. And I would like to call this the Guiding North Star. Consider sailors navigating vast oceans under the guidance of the North Star. When you look at the history of navigation at sea, before GPS and modern technology, one of the simplest methods for determining a ship's direction was to watch the movement of the sun across the sky. Sailors used the position of the sun as it moved from east to west to guide their route. At noon, they could determine north and south by the shadows the sun cast. Sailors had to literally look up to be able to figure out where they were heading. In the same way, God's word serves as our unchanging, reliable guide through the tumultuous seas of deception. Psalm 119, 105 assures us, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. As the North Star remains fixed amidst shifting skies, the truth of God's word stands unwavering, offering clarity and direction in a world filled with confusion. We must stay focused and continue in God's word. It doesn't matter how tempting it may look or how much better we think our lives will be with it. If it zaps your spiritual strength, we must turn from it and leave it alone. Children of God, it is so easy nowadays to be caught off guard and be led astray. There are all sorts of things that can hold our attention. It is so easy to slip away and not even realize that we have been caught up in the snare of the devil. Now, one of the ways that we can ensure that we are victorious is by keeping our mind on Christ. This may mean putting the phone down and spending more time with Jesus. It may mean turning off the TV or forgoing that trip out with friends. We are in the last days and time is short. Tomorrow is not promised. Have you noticed how the days are moving faster and faster? Nations are rising up against nations. There are earthquakes, famines, and wars everywhere. It's not even a shock nowadays to hear that some people are falling away from the faith. Time is truly winding up, people of God, and the King of Kings is soon to return. Will you be ready, or will you be distracted? So let me encourage you and tell you, don't allow the devil to distract you. Don't allow the world to distract you. Don't allow sin to distract you. Jesus Christ is worth so much more, much more. 
and He is the one who truly deserves our attention. A restaurant in New York City had a tremendous rating from customers when it came to their food and service in the early 2000s. There were rarely any complaints. However, as time went on, the biggest complaint became that their service was too slow. The restaurant did some research and found that to be true. The average time for service in 2004 was one hour and four minutes. However, in 2014, the average time for service became one hour and 55 minutes. The owners were confused, as they had not changed much over those past 10 years, which would cause them almost to double their service time. After looking back at the surveillance videos from 2004 to 2014, they believed the cause of the delay was actually the customers. Customers became so distracted by their cell phones that everything took longer, including ordering, eating, and paying the bill. The distraction of the cell phone had caused chaos for this restaurant. Distractions do the same thing in our Christian life. They cause chaos in our life by moving our eyes from looking toward Jesus to looking at sin. We need to turn from evil and look toward our beautiful Savior. Luke chapter 17 verse 30 to 33 says, So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop, with his goods in the house, not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. Jesus is talking to his disciples about his second coming. He reminds us that his second coming will be like any ordinary day. People will be going through their everyday routines. Then we get to verses 30 and 31, where Jesus tells us that we need to be prepared for that day and not be distracted. These illustrations are stressing that people will have no time to prepare when he appears. He then gives us the warning of Lot's wife. In Genesis, God comes to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah due to their rampant sin. Before the destruction, God comes and warns a man named Lot and his family who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. God commands Lot's family to flee and not turn back. At some point, as they flee, Lot's wife looks back at the city. In an instant, she turns into a pillar of salt. Jesus is warning us here not to be distracted like Lot's wife. If we become so distracted by the world that we completely turn our eyes away from Jesus, we will receive judgment just like Lot's wife. When we make our lives about self-preservation, we lose our lives to God's judgment. However, when we give our lives up to following Jesus, we keep it. To be clear, there will be moments in life that distract us from Jesus, but although every believer will stumble at some point, and even fall, those who continue fighting, those who repent and go to Jesus Christ, will receive forgiveness. True Christian maturity is not that we don't sin, but it's the fact that we turn our eyes back to Jesus when we fall short. However, many people have been so distracted by this world that they have never truly turned to Jesus. On Judgment Day, they will receive judgment like Lot's wife because they have completely turned and rejected God's love. There are so many distractions in life that can cause us to turn our eyes away from Jesus. Sometimes we turn and look to bad things, such as destructive substances, forbidden relationships, and lustful thoughts. When we do, we are looking to fulfill our own desires. However, these desires do not lead to the life that we think it will. Other times, we're distracted by things that can be considered good. We become distracted by our jobs, families, and hobbies. While all these things are good, when they force us to turn our eyes away from Jesus, they become idols. So we need to be on guard about any distractions in our life. Be careful being preoccupied with how much money you make, how successful your family is, or how much power you have. When good things become distractions, that can be a massive hindrance in our walk with Christ. 
Now, God is not calling you to leave your family or quit your job. Instead, he calls you to put him at first and center in your life. He should be the focus. And while it may feel like you're losing your life by turning from distractions to Jesus, you're actually gaining life. Suppose the restaurant owners I mentioned at the beginning asked people to get off their phones while at the restaurant. It would lead to much quicker service times. What feels to the customers like a loss ends up being a gain. By getting off their phones, they gain shorter meal times, deep relationships with people they're eating with, and a more enjoyable meal experience. Of course, the customers have a choice to get off their phone. However, if they choose to lose a little, they gain a lot. The same is true when it comes to turning from sin to Christ. By turning away from sin, we stop focusing on fulfilling every desire we have. And the thing is, we may lose some relationships with those around us, and we lose the right to be king or queen of our life. However, we gain so much more. We get to be called a child of God. We get to inherit eternal life. And we get to have a deeper, intimate relationship with the one true God. In the same way that customers in a restaurant have the option to get off the phone and focus on the ones they're with, then we have the option to turn our eyes to Jesus. So let me ask you, what distractions do you have in your life right now that are blocking you from seeing Jesus? It may feel almost impossible to give those distractions up, but while it may feel impossible, those in Christ have His Spirit dwelling in them. And by turning from our distractions to Jesus, He clears up the chaos and leads us to true life.